So thank you very much for all for coming uh, to this uh, talk uh, on inequality and uh, institutions. Um, and well, thank you for inviting me to Alicia, uh, Ioan, and Nina uh, to this paper here to rethink economics. And I think what better way to do it than to start with uh, this kind of set, series of seminars for undergrads. I understand is the main focus uh, of, the, of the paper. So uh, today I would like to talk about inequality, something that um, now everybody's talking about, but it was long forgotten for a long time, in, especially in economics. Uh, and institutions, again, also a topic that usually it's uh, off the curriculum, the syllabus in, in economics. Um, so before I start, I would like to do some initial statements. Okay? Uh, the first one has to do with the fact is that despite we're taught in economics, at least when I did my undergrad and postgraduate, that inequality basically is inevitable and also it is a natural fact of life, basically. Okay, and there's not much we can do, and every time we try to tackle inequality, uh, well, will affect growth and will affect efficiency. So usually it's best to stay out. At least that's the neoclassical approach to inequality. Uh, also, on the contrary, I'll argue that uh, inequality is a socially structured, uh, structural and structured uh, phenomenon. Okay, when I say socially structural, basically it's based on institutions. Okay, and when I say that it is structured, well, what I mean by that is is that actually shaped by power relations. It's not random. Institutions are not random. Institutions are generally not efficiency driven, but actually they respond to power struggles and asymmetries of, of power and classes. Okay? So having that in mind, then we can really understand the third point, which is basically inequality is multidimensional, because we're talking about not only income. Usually as economics uh, as economists we, we tend to focus too much in in, uh, in income. And basically we have to understand that this is a quite multidimensional uh, phenomenon that basically includes of course the economic sphere but also the social and political sphere as well. Uh, and of course, it has to do with re it's a relational phenomenon that has to do with asymmetries of, of power, basically. And we can see, basically, approaches of vertical inequality, that, that means among people, inequality between people, and also horizontal inequalities among groups, basically. So it's basically a relational phenomenon. And also what I want to just take out of the, of, of the discussion is that when we're talking about equality, the idea of inequality does not mean identity, okay? Uh, it tries to recognize some facts that I try to put here. One is that men are morally equal, okay? From a Kantian perspective, basically everyone, everyone has the same worth, the, the, the same, uh, they're entitled to the same level of respect uh, 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 and should be treated in that way. The second uh, has to do with, well, basically, when we talk about equality, that means that we have to apply the concept of social justice in, in a different way depending on the social sphere that we're talking about. Okay? So for example, if we're talking about politics, probably we're going to talk about equality. Everybody, every citizen should be equal to each other. But maybe if we're talking in the labor market, we'll be more uh, worried about equality of opportunity, for example. But not in a formal sense, that usually is used in the, in, the, in the more conservative discussions, but in a substantial equality of opportunity. Tunis, for example, Rawls proposes that actually means well uh, erasing uh, social disadvantages, basically attacking social disadvantages, uh, uh, and, and, and really putting everyone in the same level. Uh, and finally, uh, well, it's important when we talk about equality, as opposed to inequality, of course, is that we're basically aiming for institutions that are created, assessed develop and reform having just social justice as its main principle, okay? Uh, and just to, just to enforce this, this view, this is uh, a, a, a quote from Rawls, basically saying, social, sorry, justice is the first virtue of social institutions as truth is of system of thought, okay? So a theory how our early economical must be rejected or revised it is not untrue, uh, likewise, laws and institutions, no matter how efficient and well arranged, must be reformed or abolished if they are unjust. 
So basically, as economists were taught all the time, that the main principle of any institution, any regulation, any reform, is efficiency. Okay? And I'm trying to argue here, I don't know, actually the first virtue, the first principle that we have to address is first justice. And also, of course, that doesn't have to go against necessarily efficiency, but the first should be uh, justice if we really believe that people are morally equal. So, so once we, we, we set the, the, the stage in, in the discussion, I would like to start by do, doing a very brief discussion. I don't have much time, so I'm going to be really brief. On what are the origins of inequality, and what are the institutional consequences, implications of of, of, of this conception of the audience. Basically, what we're going to see is that there are two main approaches. One that sees inequality as natural and inevitable, and the other one that is actually a social construction. Okay? We're going to go through really briefly uh, in, in terms of this, the different disciplines, political philosophy, economics, and sociology. So, just to uh, point out two authors, but they're quite emblematical of, the, of, of these uh, two views. One is Aristotle, which was the main view basically for 2,000 years. Um, although some people will say, well, it was actually contested in some way by some religions, but basically it was the dominant idea that inequalities reflected, the inequalities we saw in society reflected actually natural differences among men. It's a quite known quote, uh, basically, it says, they are by nature free men and slaves. And that servitude is agreeable and just for the latter. Okay? This has huge implications for slavery, huge implications for colonization, for example, in Latin America, even how the church thought it should treat indigenous people if, if, there are, if they were actually human or not. So the, the Aristotelic point of view actually was very, very dominant and very influential for almost 2,000 years until the Enlightenment, Rousseau, uh, well, but I, 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 I want to. Uh, basically talk about Rousseau, where he, of course, he uh, opposes the Aristotelian view, men are equal, are equal and natural, uh, naturally equal, and basically what he sees is that inequality is created by society. Okay? So society, uh, through its institutions and basically through the creation of private property, uh, creates, starts creating inequality. Actually, he has like a quite funny quote. Uh, in his book, uh, Origins of, 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 of Inequality, in which it says, well, uh, inequality started when someone said, this is mine, and the rest were fool enough to believe him. Okay? So basically, uh, this is a, the creation of the concept of, of, of private property, which is an institution, a rule of, of who owns what. Uh, but also, the inclination towards distinction. So men are narcissists, and therefore, uh, try to, di to, to distinguish from each other, and therefore tend to compete and try to differentiate from one another and dominate and be better than the rest. So there's a, an external, if you want, a cause, but there's also a, a, a more human uh, 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 drive towards inequality as well. And this is all supported by institutions that basically what they do is they protect the most powerful in society. So that is, a, I would say, the main insights from Rousseau, in which you can see that actually inspires the rest of social sciences, especially Marx and, 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 and the, the, the conflict theorists that will come afterwards. So that's why I continue now with sociology. In sociology, you have two main views. And this, I, please excuse me, I'm being really, really brief, but just to put some insights for people that come from other backgrounds, and, and therefore, to see that there are two main opposing views on, on inequality, and they have very important implications how, how we understand institutions in that sense. One is the functionalist approach, okay, which basically sees inequality as something desirable, okay, as something functional. Okay. Basically, it sees society as a biological organism with different, basically, a society works with different roles, different organs, each uh, one of these uh, organs. Uh, if you want, just like a body has a different role, but also in the case of society has different duties and, and different rewards. So this differentiation actually is needed for society to work. So uh, the more complex societies are, of course, the more differentiation there will be, and the more inequality. And, and this inequality actually is necessary to attract uh, and allocate the most able in society. Okay. 
uh, according to well, how important is that position. So basically it's a view in terms of society as an arena of cooperation, basically, uh, and which is stuck, to, stuck together basically by consensus and shared values. There is some conflict, of course, but the main view is business. The opposing view, of course, is that conflict theories. Uh, is that inequality is a negative um, phenomenon. It is, in some cases, some of us will say it's evitable, and some will, will think it's not. Uh, but the point is, for example, in the case of Marx, uh, inequality originates in the production sphere. Okay, it has to do with class struggle for the control uh, of the means of production. Okay, so basically, the way we solve our material needs. Will, will, will determine the type of relations that we have and the type of how we organize the rest of society. So, uh, basically, in, in, the, in the way we shape the rest of, of the institution. So, basically, inequality has its origin in private property and in the division of labor, how we organize this production sphere, the, the base, the economic base, the material base, and, uh, and its implications for the exploitation and alienation of workers. Okay? In the case of, of Weber, for example, just very briefly, he says, well, the actually competition for power will determine this inequality. And this competition of power is not only in the economic sphere, but also goes into the social sphere through competition for status, for example, and also in the political sphere, okay? In, in, in the case of the parties, basically the, 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 the political power and the capacity to affect bureaucracies. So he in the case of Bayer, of course, a very important issue is bureaucracies in the capacity to affect bureaucracies in the way we organize society that, of course, affects us all and generates, of course, certain entitlements. Okay? Um, so, uh, basically, in this case, again, this society is described as basically a struggle for power. Um, and then equality, of course, is a consequence of that. Uh, Society is kept together by coercion, that means physical force, basically, and persuasion. And here we can see different authors, persuasion in terms of creation of meaning, of control, for example, of knowledge, in the case of, of Foucault, uh, the importance of media, for example, Castells, uh, or, or ideology in the case of, uh, of Gramsci. Uh, in the case of, for example, Bourdieu, he'll talk about the importance of education uh, as a system of reproduction of, of cultural capital and reproduction of inequality as a whole. So basically, what, we're, what I'm trying to to, to see here is that, that different institutions will basically um, will basically have a distributional effect on society, and these institutions are the result of this class struggles. Okay, uh, of course, maybe I'll, I'll skip this because of time, but there are attempts of synthesizing these two schools of thought, such as the attempt of Lenski. Uh, uh, Lenski, basically saying there are two laws of distribution. One that, well, basically people will cooperate to ensure survival, but then uh, regarding the, any surplus that, that, could, uh, that, that, could, that could be produced, a uh, power will deter determine that, uh, that distribution. And the important conclusion, basically, is that power will determine the capacity to basically shape institutions by the powerful in order to create period privilege. Okay, privilege, of course, for that group or social class. Okay. In the case of economics, uh, uh, basically we have two main, I just want to pose two main schools of thought. One is a neoclassical one, which basically we have been taught uh, from Ricardo on, for example, uh, which separates society in terms of classes, that the capitalist class, the class it was good for the capitalist class to accumulate a, a, a capital uh, and, and, and income, basically, because it was a class that would invest and therefore would create growth. But if we gave that money, the, the same resources to uh, the workers or the landowners, uh, that money would be spent uh, and would not create uh, capital accumulation and growth. Uh, Pareto later on uh, insisted through uh, one, of, was one of the first who actually started seeing this, uh, 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 search, searching for, for empirical aliens. And he, he saw that actually the body was fixed in time in space, okay. So most of the of of, of the countries he um, basically European countries he analyzed. He saw he saw that there was a pattern, uh, and therefore uh, he saw he, he thought actually that uh, inequality was fixed in, in space. That means through time and in space so between different countries. So 
Uh, it was a kind of a, a fact of life. Uh, in the case of Kuznet, and I think I believe Alicia talked that in the in the in the previous class. Uh, that of course, what he saw is that uh, uh, Kuznet should argue that inequality goes through a quite predictable pattern. As far as it increases, and then it increases uh, with development. Okay. Hitcher Lee, for example, would insist that free trade actually would create a equalization of factor uh, prices. What I'm trying to put here and, and, and show you here that all different authors through time of neoclassical economics have, have more or less taken the same stand. Basically, inequality either is fixed, has nothing to do about it, or will be fi get fixed in the case of of Kuznet, or the market will take care of it in the case of, for example, uh, uh, Hitcher Olin or Samuel Stopper, uh, saying basically through, through the market free free trade will have the equalization of, of, um, of factor prices. Okay? And the last and most influential, uh, which of course goes from the solo model on, and a lot of authors, but for example, there's quite good research now by, by Golden and Katz from Harvard, that they show this race between technological change and education. So basically, there's a, a skill bias technological change, which basically increases the premium for skilled workers. And that is the main explanation for the neoclassical school uh, of thought of, of, of why inequality has increased. Basically, because of technological change in the one hand, and the other one because of globalization, which increases through the insertion of India and China especially, uh, increases the supply of unskilled workers. So basically the relative wages uh, increase uh, for the advantage of the skilled workers. Okay? Uh, so this school of thought, which is basically based on the individual, uh, uh, is contested by the institutional economic uh, school, which basically sees the individual as a social being. Okay, in which is embedded, and the markets as well, are embedded in social structures, in social institutions. Okay? Uh, I won't go through the difference between the old and the new, but basically uh, uh, the important, most important conclusion is the institutions matter. And in some cases, depending on, on the authors, that well, path dependency and history is key and, and, and quite important to determine inequality. So, uh, what I'm trying to, just to uh, maybe because I, of course I, I've gone quite fast through different authors, I just want to point out graphically, if you want, uh, to summarize the two, the two views of how we see inequality just as an individual in the market, which is the, the I call it the traditional view. Uh, basically you have here, the, let's say, the distribution of income, a triangle trying to kind of um, and denote the, the social structure, which is influenced by physical assets, wages, and transfer and tax from, from the government. So basically, it's an issue of wages. So when you see Piketty, when you see uh, Stiglitz talking about inequality, usually we're, we're talking about this. Wages, the role of the state, physical assets, uh, or financial assets, and basically returns. Okay? Uh, and what I'm trying to argue here is that we should see inequality a little bit more like this. Basically, you have the level of inequality, of course, is related to uh, the returns uh, and, 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 and distribution of assets, but this is actually determined by institutions, okay? Uh, and these institutions, on the other hand, are determined by power relations and by history, okay? So, all the discussion of inequality is embedded, basically, in institutions. So, the million dollar question is, what are institutions, of course? Uh, so that's what I want to go through now. What are institutions, why they matter, how they change, and what are the policy implications? So when we talk about institutions, we say we're talking about formal and informal institutions. By formal, we mean legal, uh, for example, laws, I mean, legal rules, such as laws, uh, regulations, etc. Basically, laws are explicit, I mean, or rules are explicit, and they are enforceable by third parties, basically, okay? Uh, but when we talk about informal institutions, we're talking about basically social institutions, social norms, okay? Which are informal, they're not explicitly uh, written in any, in any uh, law or constitution. Uh, institutions will determine the economic performance and the distribution of, of resources and power to society. That's uh, the main importance of institutions. They affect both development, but also the distribution of resources 
uh, that are gained from one by, by, by that development. We can think of just a bit two examples. For example, tax policy, the tax reform. Uh, it will affect, of course, economic performance. Some people will say higher taxes will, for example, reduce growth. Or some will people will say, no, actually, higher taxes will increase growth by providing public goods. Okay? And, of course, tax policies will affect distribution of resources by the redistribution done by the government. Okay? If you think not of a formal, but of an informal uh, institution, let's uh, think about, for example, uh, rules that discriminate in, against female. Okay? Uh, and, for example, let's say a social norm is that females should not work in the labor market but should stay home, okay, like, like in many societies. Uh, what, what, what would happen is that, for example, economic performance will be affected. There's less part female participation in the labor market, for example. But also, there will be an issue on distribution of resources the, in power. In, if you think in the household, in, in, the, in the family, basically, women don't, don't have an income, they have less power, and, and, and in some cases, for example, depending on the social norms or, or your formal norms, a woman won't be able, for example, to inherit land, uh, which happens in a lot of, for example, uh, Muslim communities in the developing world. Okay. So basically, these formal or informal rules will always have this impact on economic performance and distribution of income. So, doing a, 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 a more precise discussion on what the institutions do, uh, first they set and determine property rights. Okay? Uh, by property rights, I think about, for example, land, land reforms, who owns what, uh, or even people, slavery, for example. Which, uh, which is historically quite recent, if you want. Uh, and also, of course, it affects the allocation of resources. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go here into the cost theorem, but for those who, who are economists and, and, and have heard about it, basically what the cost theory says is that if transaction costs are zero, then it doesn't matter actually the distribution of income and the distribution of resources will not affect the allocation of resources. So it doesn't matter the distribution of, of income, the economy, basically, the, the economy will reach the same equilibrium in terms of goods that are produced in the economy. But if transaction costs are high, are, are, are uh, positive, basically, then the distribution of income will have an effect on the allocation of resources. Okay? So, uh, uh, this is what we're being taught. But the, 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 the funny thing is that usually, I actually cost put this, uh, the transaction cost equals zero as a quite exceptional an uh, unreal situation. And the funny thing is that usually you see in the syllabus that uh, in economics we're taught all the theory in terms of, well, since mm -hmm. transaction costs are equal to zero, then blah, blah, blah. And in reality, we all know that transaction costs are higher than zero. So actually, uh, distribution of income and resources is exam it's, it's a key uh, factor. In the institutions will also, also affect the, um, the way we interact in society. Okay, uh, and therefore the efficiency of society. It will, the different rules will make us cooperate or compete with each other. Just to put an example, real life example, for example, in Chile, uh, the country where I'm from, uh, we just changed, for example, the um, criteria to enter university. Uh, or the, uh, and so one of the criteria is the ranking that you had in your school in terms of your grades. So before, before this, this change, we had uh, people would, um, would, be, would be selected in terms of a, uh, of a score by, by, standard, by standard test, but also in terms of their absolute grade. Okay? So in that sense, you could cooperate, for example, with your classmates. Okay? But now that you're selected also, or your chances of getting selected depends on your relative grade in your own course, in your, own, uh, 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 in, in your school, basically you're going to be incentivized to compete with your classmates. So just to put, of course, the, the, the discussion is more complex than that, but I just want to put some uh, potential implications of some changes in rules in the way we cooperate or compete with each other, okay? Uh, institutions that create some regulations, for example, um, in the productive sector, for example, creating monopolies, uh, uh, will create, well, will lead us to uh, put our efforts in productive sectors or unproductive sectors, for example, in the case of, of um, 
rich natural resources uh, countries uh, in which monopolies are created and then therefore uh, a lot of resources are devoted to just seek, see, uh, rent seeking and basically Ricardian rents. Uh, rules that create or limit markets, if you think about uh, child uh, labor, for example, okay? Some regulations that, well, basically raise the, the age, or in the case of Bolivia just now, they, they actually decreased the, the number of years uh, to, uh, to allow uh, more, more children to actually work in the labor market, will expand or reduce markets. Of course, uh, laws will regulate uh, markets and will affect especially transaction costs. And uh, for those who are not economists, why transaction costs are important, just in a very simplified way, we say, well, basically, uh, in a very simplified way, we, what we say is, if we have exchange, if, 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 if the market works and there's exchange in the market, people can actually specialize in one uh, duty, in, in, in one imposing one good, for example, and therefore division of labor, of course. And as a division of labor, of course, we have specialization, we have productivity growth and economic development. Okay? Uh, from a Ricardo approach, this just taken to the international level. Free trade allows, again, to have international division of labor and to take advantage of, of um, relative uh, competitive advantages. And, and that leads to economic uh, development. So the whole point is that if we have transaction costs to exchange, to trade goods, then this whole chain of events uh, is hindered, basically. Uh, it's slowed down. So therefore, that affects development. Um, and finally, uh, before I go to, to some examples now, uh, institutions that determine also individual behavior, preferences, and identity. Okay? Uh, if you want to say it in a different way, we could say institutions affect exogenously the way we behave. For example, a law says, do not uh, smoke. Okay? So you're being hindered from smoking. Uh, but also, and this is more important for inequality, uh, it will uh, affect, for example, through social norms, social expectations of certain groups. So there are a lot of studies show, for example, poor black communities uh, in which the social norms basically that they have, there's a very low expectation of them uh, in terms of, of, of going to college, or university, and therefore that would be in, uh, that would be that, 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 that expectation will affect uh, people's preferences and people's identities. Uh, they, they will incorporate. Uh, that social expectation into their own preference. So, in that sense, institutions affect you endogenously. Basically, pre preference uh, in opposition to the neoclassical uh, perspective. In this case, preferences are endogenous. They are affected uh, by uh, social uh, norms. Now, how does, do these institutions emerge and how do they change? Uh, because it's a quite important question for, well, well, if these institutions are actually creating this distribution of resources, well, where do they come from? Uh, why, do they, why do we have the institutions we actually have in, in any society? Why are the institutions in Brazil different than institutions in the UK uh, and different than the ones in China? Well, there are three main approaches uh, to answer this question. One is a functionalist or utilitarian view uh, based on efficiency, basically, maximization and, rational and, and rationality. Uh, the second one has to do with power uh, distribution, basically power struggles, I, think, I mean, as I was talking before. And then cultural and sociological uh, perspective that has to do more with how uh, values and culture are actually embodied in institutions. I'm just going to discuss the first two because of the limitations of time. Uh, so, in, in respect to the functionalist approach, which is more associated with new, economic, uh, 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 new institutional economics, basically, institutions are seen and in, are in analyzed in terms of their function in society, okay? Uh, and their capacity to reduce transactional costs, their capacity to, to foster efficiency, uh, and in, in, in summary, in their capacity to solve collective problems. Okay, so you're looking for collective, collective gains, basically. Okay, um, so it's a it's a positive uh, it's a positive game. Everybody can actually win thanks to uh, and can actually gain 
uh, thanks to uh, cooperation and, 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 and institutions that tend to be more and more efficient. Okay, so the drivers, as I was saying, is efficiency. So if there are uh, institutions that are, in, that are created, for example, intentionally, there will be basically the state would try to create laws that are looking for the most efficient way of, uh, uh, of developing any activity. But, uh, so that, that would be one way. Or the other, actually it's more like a Darwinian perspective in the sense that actually institutions under this approach would be selected through the market, okay? So the most effective or efficient institutions would survive and the, the others that prove not to be so efficient would be substituted, basically, okay? Um, So if you, if you think of, for example, capital, capital control, uh, rules of capital control among countries, well, some, some countries will say, oh, you know, those who have capital controls have less instability, and therefore it's superior in terms of efficiency, for example. And, and therefore, countries should copy that kind of institution. That, that, that's kind of the, the logic of the competitive selection um, uh, approach. Uh, the other approach has to do with uh, power distribution. And basically, the focus is not efficiency, it's not outcome. Uh, it has to do mu much more with struggles uh, and distribution of resources, basically. Okay? So, institutional change is a result of social struggle and conflict, and basically reflects these asymmetries of power. Okay? So, people are struggling to basically uh, shape institutions in order to benefit themselves. Uh, and therefore, of course, the change of an institution will respond to the change of balance of power. Okay, uh, which is, brings us quite importantly to the re relevance of political transaction costs. That means the costs of actually organizing the political arena in order to, to bargain and, and, and reach some agreements, but also and especially of transition costs. Uh, that is the capacity of opposition to block and, and hinder initiatives of the proponents, in this case, could be the state. Okay, uh, so usually many. Um, Progressive, for example, progressive reforms will be blocked by a position if there's a high transi transitional cost. And therefore, we will be asking ourselves, why does a country have that kind of institution? Okay, is it because of lack of capacity, lack of will? No, probably it's because of transitional cost. It's the ca capacity to actually move that proposal forward, because at least in democratic countries, or even non-democratic countries, you have a opposition that can actually impose costs for those who want to change the institution. Okay? Costs that could be, again, in a democracy, political costs, or uh, even uh, by, by force in, in coercion. Uh, we can see the, uh, a politician has just been killed in, in Russia. Uh, so the, 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 if you want to start a transition cost as well, I mean, violence, of course, is a transition cost. The capacity of imposing uh, that cost, in this case, uh, to, to, to something, someone opposing. So basically, these are the two approaches. And now I want to quickly discuss very two uh, applications of, 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 of institutions, why they matter, uh, and, the, and, and also in the case of education that I will start, is to opposing this neoclassical view of education versus um, a, a, a view more based in sociology and, and, and conflict theory. Uh, so, education we're taught usually, uh, we're taught that it's actually something good for, for inequality in the sense that uh, uh, it provides social mobility, uh, it fosters equality, and from the economic point of view, uh, the human capital theory uh, by Schultz, Becker, uh, etc., uh, basically tells us that education uh, helps create skills, uh, increases labor productivity, etc. And in the macro sphere, uh, theories like, like uh, uh, by, by Romer uh, and, uh, and Lucas tell us basically that well, education allows the creation of ideas, uh, it fosters innovation, and therefore um, uh, growth, basically. So this is kind of the, the traditional approach. Uh, but when we start seeing education as an institution, uh, and, and when I say as an institution, is as a rules of the game, so, so as a set of different rules who saying who is accepted, who is excluded, what are the rules to, to uh, advance and progress through the system, and what are actually are the gains for those who, who, those for, for those who win the game, 
uh, those who get to the Harvard, what, what, what are the, 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 the gains for them, the prices? And those who actually fail, um, uh, actually those who get kicked out maybe in 12th grade of school, well, what happens with them as well? So all these rules are, are, are set. And basically, when we see education systems that way, and the way they, the way they are shaped, uh, we can start seeing that education actually is a device for social reproduction. Okay? Social reproduction of inequality. Okay? Uh, basically, plays two roles. On the one hand, it plays a role socializing, uh, socializing the different the values of society. Okay, the culture and values of society, and therefore has a role in terms of maintaining the status quo of society. Okay, so this is how society runs, and therefore it tends to, of course, reproduce this, the also social norms in terms of discrimination for them. Okay, uh, but also. Uh, this, the, the education plays a role in terms of selection of the most able uh, in society uh, in a kind of meritocratic way. Okay, that's the, that's the, the promise. to say those who progress adequately, adequately through the system are actually those who deserve to be in the better positions in society. Okay? Uh, but actually that doesn't really happen. The way the educational system is actually shaped, we see that uh, uh, actually reproduces inequality one, there are very different theories, but, but one, for example, from Bowles and Gintis says there's a hidden curriculum, okay? Basically, uh, the school system is set in a way that affects expectations, okay? So, uh, elite, uh, uh, children from the elite are taught in schools that actually teach them to break the rules, to be innovative, uh, to be creative, uh, to lead, okay? Uh, and on the other hand, poor schools or, or schools in poor, uh, in poor communities teach children to be obedient, uh, to follow the norm, um, to uh, so, so basically to be good workers. The other ones to be good leaders. So basically, the the system, the educational system, what it does is it reproduces the social division of labor, uh, and, and 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 it's an instrument of of this reproduction of, of inequality. Uh, from another perspective, uh, Bourdieu sees uh, education as a device for the reproduction of, of cultural capital. Okay? Uh, and therefore, what he basically uh, uh, discusses is that the education system is shaped in a way that, uh, well, in accordance, if you want, uh, to the legitimate culture of the elite, okay? which all actually enables elite children to take advantage in a better way of the education system and advance in a, in a, in a, in a, in a proper way uh, in opposition to uh, children from poor communities which do not have the culture and do not have the resources to take advantage of the opportunities given by the uh, educational system. And therefore we end up with uh, two, two main uh, concepts that he proposes. One of false meritocracy in the sense that uh, we tend to, to think basically that people that go to the Oxbridges or to the Harvards, etc. Uh, they deserve basically this. Um, uh, they deserve the credential, and the credential basically gives them path, uh, a clear path to the better, uh, better positions in society. And actually, they deserve that because they went through the system. It's a kind of meritocracy. But in reality. What the education system uh, did, basically, is that it reproduced the advantage that, that, that children from the elite had already. So basically, uh, it legitimizes uh, the inequality, the initial inequality, but through the education system, we lose track of the inequality, and then we tend to, again, we tend to uh, misrecognize the sources of that mer uh, merit. Okay? Uh, in that sense, since we attach to these credentials, we attach uh, some, basically, we, we attach, uh, uh, some, uh, uh, we attach some honor and, 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 and status to this kind of, of, of uh, credentials that we get in the educational system. Uh, there's this, this symbolic violence uh, towards the, the lower classes, because basically what we're saying is, well, people actually made it, uh, they're better than you. So uh, if you didn't make it to the system, it's because of your fault, basically. And that means, basically, you have less ability, less virtue, if you want, um, 
and, and, and therefore uh, inequality is justified. Another example, yeah, perhaps. We should be yeah. five minutes for questions. Uh, can do can I add, add it's two, two slides, just to finish. So another example is a tax policy as, a, as an institution. Well, what we can see here is that the way tax policies are arranged in different societies are a, a huge effect on inequality. So for example, here we have Latin America, which has a genie of 0.52 when we look at uh, the primary distribution of income, that means the distribution of income that happens in the market. Uh, while, for example, Europe has 0.46, which is not so far. But the interesting thing is if you see the market income distribution and you compare it with the disposal of income, okay, that means after taxes have been collected and then after transfers have been given, uh, what you, you can see is that actually Gini in Latin America goes from 0.52 to 0.50. So basically nothing happened. But in the case of Europe, it goes from 0.46 to 0.31. So that means actually, the, the, I mean, there's a quite important reduction of inequality uh, thanks to the role and intervention of the government through the tax system and the institutional uh, system. If we take into account not only uh, cash transfers, but also in-kind uh, goods and services given by the government, then uh, the, 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 uh, the, I mean, the differences are, are much bigger. It goes from 0.52 2.47 in the case of Latin America, so not, not much happened, but it goes from 0.47 in the case of Europe to 0.26 in the case of, other, uh, I mean, after, uh, in, in Europe as well, but after taxes and services have been provided by the state. So my point here is that, of course, tax policy as an institution, as rules of who should pay what and who, sh who, sh who should receive what, has a huge impact on inequality. And basically, this set by two, and, and, and these are the last even two, two issues. One, this is explained because uh, by the fact that Latin America has very low level of tax uh, revenues, uh, even when we compare in terms of its level of development. So here we have GDP, and here we have total revenue uh, as a percentage of GDP. And what we can see here, the black dots, gold dots, are Latin American countries, most of Latin American countries are below the level they would be expected for the uh, level of development. Okay? So they have very low tax collection. Second, they have very low taxes in terms of rates. If you see, for example, personal taxes is 29%, while most of the countries here in Africa, which less, is less developed, is 34 and 38. Corporate taxes are also the, 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 the lowest in, 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 uh, around the world. VAT is more or less, I mean, among the lowest, but not, not so much. But what's important is basically that not only taxes are low, but the structure of taxes as well is quite regressive. So basically, this is a collection in terms of the percentage of tax revenue. So most of the tax in Latin America comes from VAT. Okay, which is a quite regressive tax. While in most of the other countries, uh, for example the OECD, there is a much more balanced equilibrium between personal taxes, which is a quite a pro progressive uh, tax, and, um, and VAT. Okay, so just a final statement. Basically, what it says, uh, rose again, uh, well, just summarizing, it says, well, life is neither just nor unjust. What is just or unjust is the way the institutions deal with these facts. Okay? So thank you very much.